Okay, in three. Okay, ready? All right, and we are back between two yeses. Yes, How are you, sir? Fine, thank you. Thanks for having me. No, not a problem. Thank you for being here. We're That's actually uh, just outside your office on the beautiful new river in downtown Fort Lauderdale. Can you tell us exactly what MISF is? Sure. Marine Industries Association of South Florida is an, uh, an organization that was founded in 1961 by a, a group of business owners that realized that uh, the industry, as it was starting to grow, needed a bigger voice, needed some collaborative uh, efforts, and uh, to tackle what could be anything that we deal with today, legislative, environmental, whatever it may be. And by doing so, uh, ended up becoming the owners of the Fort Lauderdale International Boat Show because mm -hmm. some people that were early members had the foresight to realize that, hey, maybe a boat show could work to, to uh, help sell the product. And uh, 59 years later, I think, this year's show, uh, the rest is history. Good luck. And has it always been at the Bahamar location just down the river here? Or is no, it no, it's moved over the years. It's been everything from the port to up the river to, uh, you know, just at the pier, uh, but uh, no, it's been at Bahia Mar since the mid 80s and um, it's doing quite well. Doing very, very well. And MISF has been growing every year. I mean, now you're quite a Goliath organization, right? Or would you not yeah. quite say? I think the bigger thing is, is, is not necessarily the size, is the quality, right? Yeah. And so what makes good organizations are the people that are in it uh, from the staffing perspective and then the, the partner companies that you bring in. And so the goal isn't to be necessarily the largest, it's to thoughtfully work through issues that are affecting our industry, take a leadership position. And, uh, and, and in today's world, you know, again, you live in the, the, we happen to be in the third largest state in the country. It doesn't always just pertain directly to marine. It can be the indirect, so the unintended consequences. You, obviously you do legislative and help build the marine industry. What's some of the uh, successes you've had over the last few years? I was reading about the, the sales tax cap. Is that one of them you guys did? That was a great one, yeah. And so again, to give Florida and, and uh, to give this region an edge over other states or, or other countries, we passed a sales tax cap that uh, initially it caps at a million dollars. So anything over a million dollars is in, is in tax on the 6%. Going forward, we're trying to lower it to a half million dollars. But we've coupled that with starting the first ever foreign trade zone, uh, not only in the country, but in the world. And that's just another tool in the toolkit for the businesses in terms of how to uh, free up working capital, how to work more efficiently, how to show vessels that a lot of boats as you get bigger are foreign flagged. How do you show those boats to prospective clients, which you know the U.S. is the largest audience in the world, mm -hmm. and yet we used to restrict that. So how, do, how you mean foreign trade zone, can you explain that a little bit, what that actually means for the industry and how it Sure. Works? So what it was is initially, nice thing about a foreign trade zone, it doesn't have to be waterfront, mm -hmm. uh, but if you look in aviation, it's pretty commonplace, foreign trade zones. Uh, and so what it allows to do is imported product um, to free up working capital or to pull out the duty from that uh, charge. And by doing so for our industry, if you look at a lot of the boats that pass behind you here or they're in our show, maybe they're built in... Uh, Asia, maybe they're built in Europe, so you, dealers may stock those boats. Mm -hmm. That frees, they have to pay one and a half percent duty. And so by uh, foregoing that to the ultimate sale, um, they free up working capital, which can be tens of millions of dollars. So it basically defers the payment of the tax until the actual boat. Until so. how it's flagged, correct. Then um, what are you working on that you maybe can tell us a little bit about? So, you know, a lot of different things. So again, to get the wins, you have to have a good team. And so, you know, South Florida Business Journal, I'm sure you read it. Absolutely. There's the book of lists. There was the book of, you know, the top 25 banks, top 25 auto dealers, real estate. Here we are, uh, $11.5 billion industry between Palm Beach and Miami, and we weren't in there, believe it or not. <laughs> and so uh, by sitting down with a group of stakeholders, uh, we were able to formulate a list, get the participation from our industry, ba either based on employee or revenue. And now we just finished our third year of that list. And, and that was a big milestone because that's something that the elected officials read. That's something that a person could be from a, one of our western uh, cities in the county here, or uh, a legislator could be in Tallahassee, but hand them the book of list, they get that, yeah. and the jobs that are created by that. Because it is a lot of jobs that are created by the marine industry. It's, I mean, it's more than I think anyone realizes, right? Well, and, and, and again, once the world kind of tipped over in 08, 09, everyone realizes that, you know, higher education's wonderful, but there's a certain trade skill that's being missed, not only in our industry, in, in uh, construction, in automotive and things, and they pay very good wages. So you think of, we are in Florida, today happens to be a really nice cool day, but HVAC, big needs, right? Welding, carpentry, uh, you name it, electricians. Yeah. So uh, by doing those things, you can advocate on those, on those benefits um, and using the book of lists to change the schools the way they, the way they offer classes.
Very interesting. Because you guys are now doing, we obviously interviewed Sean at the Fort Lauderdale boat yeah. about the salty jobs. He's going in and doing these trades that would otherwise really be missed, right? So it's the same thing. Sitting here today, um, you know, this won't end up in a written article. This ends up on video. Yeah. And so the CEO of AT&T spoke at a conference I went to a couple years ago. And his business is up 150,000%. And it wasn't because he beat Verizon selling more phones, it was because of video. Yeah. And so again, if you want to learn something, you go on YouTube, right? Yeah, and it'll teach you how to do yeah. it. So it was the same thing with, with this. Uh, you think old job fairs, historically they put out a little uh, you know, uh, table, put a black cloth over it, and put out a squishy ball, a pen set, and say, hey, come work in our industry, come work for the bank, or whatever it may be. The kids today, they all want to work for Google, they want to work for Jeff Bezos and Amazon, whatever it may be, but the reality of it is not everyone will. Yeah. We have a great industry, so by doing the video series, it's something that lives, so if they want to show their parents at eight o'clock at night or, or uh, 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning, they can sit there and show them on a device, their phone, hey, mom, dad, I want to get in this industry, and by the way, it pays 28% higher than the state average. Whew. wow. You, so, I had this conversation with my wife the other day. We've got a three-year-old, and I don't want to send him to college unless it's something you need to go to college for. Sure. Is that what you guys are trying to advocate a little bit more? Like, come and learn a trade rather than going and learning about English literature unless you want to be a teacher? <laughs> so, we're not, not necessarily trying to hit that head-on in terms of it's got to be an either-or. It's an and, which is... You know, maybe you want to go to a four-year school, maybe you don't. And a lot of times, a lot of these trades, they require additional education. It could be a, a one-year, two-year, or three-year certificate. But again, when you look around us here and you realize, that, you know, we're operating in the third largest state in the nation. Yeah. Right now, we currently have, give or take, 19 million residents. By, you know, two decades out, we're going to be over 25 million residents. So you think of the opportunities. How many people do you know that necessarily became a CPA or a lawyer owned their own firm? where if you look at the HVAC side of life, air conditioning or welding, those guys in our industry, it's, it's a bunch of mom and pops. Yeah. And you know, a guy can learn a trade, work for someone for a few years, and, and guess what, hang their own shingle out and do a good ethical job and add value to our industry and own a business that someday they could transfer to somebody else. Yeah, plumbing. So it's kind of cool, plumbing, perfect example. I'll tell you what, when my toilet blocks up, it's 500 <laughs> bucks to get someone out to rob that. And, and that's if you call them during the week, right? If you call them on a Sunday, God knows oh, what that is. I, I, yeah. I go outside. If, if that ever happens. Well, that's the nice thing about all the boats, especially as you go larger in our industry, which is a good, you know, a large percentage of what we do also. Mm. Um, as you know, they're moving cities. They have HVAC, they have mm -hmm. plumbing, they have MSDs, electrical issues, navigation, whatever it may be. And so uh, having a good, uh, having a good uh, workforce is, mm -hmm. is important to our industry. Now, MISF has always had their headquarters here in Lauderdale. They have. Is they that... Have. A specific reason for that is like is the industry bigger here than in Miami or Palm Beach? Or is it is. In, in, in Fort Lauderdale, it's an $8.8 .8 billion industry. I don't think it was strategic at the time. I think the founding members were here in Fort Lauderdale, and so it just kind of grew from there. But we just actually moved from our other offices uh, down the road to the offices here, and this is the historic district. And it's right behind a beautiful uh, railroad bridge. And it was a strategic move because City Hall is right there, Broward County is right there, their uh, leadership. And then the railroad bridge, you know, again, we need infrastructure in this state. Yeah. And we're kind of at the center of advocating for it, thoughtfully for everybody, but also for the needs of the marine industry. So you guys are lobbyists as well then? Is that get set up right? Or? No, so what we do there is, is uh, hopefully pick the right lobbyists that can get their mess, our message across in a thoughtful way that understands that if we don't do these things, there's unintended consequences, which is jobs, yeah. which is infrastructure. And so this industry is really unique to this area. But guess what? Georgia wants it, Louisiana wants it, South Carolina, and then all of Europe would like this industry because not only does it, uh, uh, not only does it create a lot of jobs and, and uh, economic input, but it also brings the best entrepreneurs to the zip code. It certainly does. Certainly. Do you see the industry growing at an exponential rate, or are we going to run out of room here, or is that when it will spill over to Palm Beach and then Miami a little well, bit Well, the nice more? thing about it, Miami and Palm Beach both have you know, really thriving industries. Again, it was just because it was centered here that it, I believe it grew a little bit more, but now it is kind of strategically located when yeah. you look at it. We are in between uh, Palm Beach and Miami, and so I, again, working with our, our neighboring counties and the people and the businesses that reside in there, and, and Palm Beach has a marine industry association. Working closely with them, I think we can add value to the whole community. Oh, they have their own. They do. But you're South Florida though, right? Right, and so 
again, they bring us in on issues, we ask them to come in on issues, and, and if you work collaboratively, it's, again, it's not a competition. Yeah. It's not about who has more members or who has this. Uh, the reality is uh, Marine Industry Association of South Florida, MISF, owns the Fort Lauderdale International Boat Show, as does the Marine Industry of Palm Beach. They own the Palm Beach Boat Show. Who owns the Miami one? So the Miami show is owned, the one that happens on Key Biscayne yeah. owned by National Marine Manufacturers NMMA. up in Chicago, NNMA. But the one that happens on Collins, the Yacht Brokerage Show, um, is owned by the Yacht Brokers Association and uh, show management equally. Gotcha, gotcha. Talk about real quick about the full order boat show just down that you guys did an amazing job this year with the changes in dates, the new flooring and everything like that. It was very, very good. We were very impressed. Where are you going to go from after that? I mean, you, you can't expand anymore. But I mean, what, what's the next thing for next year? So the date change was something that started a, a couple years ago where we moved it out of October into November, moved the show. And then the goal was to eventually drop Monday, but make sure we got the right feedback from the exhibitors and the attendees. Mm -hmm. uh, one exhibitor told me at this year's show, uh, no Monday had ever felt like that Wednesday, which was <laughs> nice to hear. But the reality of it is our partner in this in terms of uh, the logistical side is show management. And show management's a tremendous logistic company Absolutely. that does Miami, uh, the one on Collins. They do the Palm Beach show and they do a couple shows on the, on the other coast. Um, they're really good at what they do. Yep. And so again, if everyone works together and collaborates, uh, it's going to benefit the industry and the exhibitors and the attendees, and that's what we did this year. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the new proposed plans that I saw were just approved the other sure. day? Sure. So Bahiamar. I mean, is the show going to leave Bahiamar? No, I mean, no. So we just, again, part of that strategically over the last couple of years was signing a new 30-year agreement with our promoter, yeah. uh, which is show management, which has since been acquired by Informa Group, which is a, a globally leading exhibition company that does over 100 trade shows in the U.S., I believe they're three plus billion dollar pound company. And so what they should bring to the table is, uh, is a lot more depth and, and knowledge that uh, to add new clients. They, they can leverage the client list that they have for different shows. Mm -hmm. And equally important, they have a lot of different resources. But with the actual planned renovation over for BHMR. at, at BHMR. So we finished a 30 year agreement with them. Sorry, I, I sidetracked. Yeah, and it. we did a 30 year agreement with BHMR also. Mm -hmm. And so that is the hub uh, for the show at the end of the day. They've only got a 30 year lease left, right? They have 47 years left. Okay. And so by making sure, our lease was going to be up in 2020. Um, so last thing we needed was the perception. Sometimes perception is worse than reality. Absolutely. So the perception was, oh, what are we going to do? So by getting that ironed out and then working with them thoughtfully through the lo logistics of the redevelopment, mm -hmm. we know that we can uh, make a world-class show going forward for decades to come. And there will be changes, but the changes will be a positive experience. It's not a negative. Our square footage that we have in our contract remains the same that we need. Right. So it's a good thing. So with the demo, demo you might actually be able to increase your footprint a little bit, yeah? Well, I, I, I think we're going to give better experiences. You know, when you look at some of those buildings, um, a new hotel will give a better experience. If they didn't get this right to improve, yeah. uh, we wouldn't have a new hotel. So for the next 47 years, I don't think our clients or the exhibitors want to look at that hotel. Equally important, the footprint with the new flooring that you talked about this mm -hmm. year, yeah. by raising the seawalls and raising the uh, uplands in that area, we can eliminate some of the drainage problems also. So nice. there's just a lot of other things. When you look at the beach, you've got a Ritz, you've got a Hilton, you've got uh, the Atlantic, all, uh, Conrad, all these things have come online. And yet we have, you know, the prime property on the East Coast is Bahia Mar. Mm -hmm. And now by, by allowing the development to take place, by us having a permanent home, it's a benefit for our industry and for our community and moves Lauderdale along with it. When do we think we're going to see the start breaking ground on that? I would, I, I don't know, but I would, I would imagine <laughs> over the next decade, you'll start seeing some things happen. Very cool. So it's a, definitely a long-term project. Yeah, it's a long-term project. The people that uh, have the control of the lease, the Tates, are uh, South Florida families, and they've been uh, really good to work with through the process of the logistics in uh, securing our long-term commitment on the property. Very cool. And just real quick about the association. So you have a board of directors. I saw Danielle Butler on yeah. this. She's obviously a lawyer, but how does she, is she a volunteer in this industry? Yeah, so we've got, again, really passionate people that run for board positions. You have to be elected. Um, and so we've got everyone from ex-elected officials to really the principals of companies that drive this industry yeah. that are board members. And uh, they get together once a month, they dedicate their time. You know, we build houses for Habitat for Humanity. That is awesome. We give scholarships away. We do the plywood regatta. We do uh, the waterway cleanup. We do Marine Industry Day right down the river here. And all those people volunteer at those things. But equally important, donate their energy, their time, and their skill set, whatever it may bring uh, uh, of ideas. That Habitat for Humanity has become a really big project, doesn't it? It's I mean, important, yeah. I mean, it's you guys important. just go and build houses, right? For yeah. People. 
this cool. year was for a veteran family. And so it's really, it's important to give back to the community. It's one of those things that you can touch and feel. And, uh, you know, this is a veteran family that we built the house for. They have, I think, four kids. And so, you know, our whole thing is hopefully a couple of those kids will enter our industry someday. But even mm -hmm. if they don't, our whole thing is whatever you're going to do, do it well. So if you want to go to college, get good grades. When you get to that point, contact the association. We'll try to help you out financially. Very cool. Can we talk a little bit about you? I you guess, yeah. I mean, I know you were a, a partner at Westport, right? I was. You say who you work with Ryan? Was it Ryan over there? Ron Nugent, yeah, great yeah. guy, great guy. Uh, Daryl Wakefield and Darryl, uh, yeah. and Ornettes and and. Uh, Did uh, you start the company with them? No, no. So the company was started again uh, back in about 1964, I believe, 61 or 64, I can't remember. Mm. Um, and Rick and Randy Rust uh, were the principals when I got involved in the company in the mid 90s. Uh, great guys, and they just wanted again. They had hit the ceiling of where they could take it to, and Orrin Edson had sold the company called Bayliner. Bayliner, yeah. And um, and with that came a lot of knowledge that he brought to the large boat industry that before those disciplines really didn't exist, and yep. it had to do with tooling that were more uh, simplistic that would cut hours out but build a better boat. Mm -hmm. And so by uh, by him guiding us and uh, and leading us down those paths, uh, Westport became what it is today. Because you're. When was your peak time at Westport? I mean, it was early 2000s, you were cranking out those. So times. really when you get into that 06, 07, 08, mm -hmm. and actually post the, the meltdown, it was still going really well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is we brought, a, again, a new business model to the community where mm. when you looked at a 130 foot boat, no one was building a series, foot bo a series boat. No one was building a series of 112s. Everyone used to say, well, you can sell a few of them, but are you gonna sell that many? Who wants the same boat? Well. Mm. But it's no different than aviation. If you've got a G5 and you see three other G5s on the tarmac or Gulfstream, that's called success. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with the 130. And now they're on to the 164. Uh, and I, I know they have other plans for other boats. Well, I just saw a 164 just sold and the previous owner took that boat all around the world. There you go. It was in the Pacific, Norway, everywhere. And that's that's a great testament to the quality of boat. And it is a great quality boat. That, that boat, as an example, the guy who did that boat was an entrepreneur in the U.S. Mm -hmm. He's building another big U.S. boat right now. Okay. Um, and equally important, it showed the, the quality of the product. He flew private. He had a jet and he wanted that predictability and that product gave the predictability and a lot, you know so many other builders have done that now Amels have done that a lot of the pe people in that size range have gotten in the series build san lorenzo uh, and with that comes a better experience in the marketplace would you call that the westport business model i would call that the westport business model for westport you know I, everyone would like to think they have that original idea but mm -hmm. somewhere else it was like country kitchens country yeah. kitchens broward actually which was built here the denison family mm -hmm. they kind of invented the country kitchen at the end of the day and so what you do is improve upon other people's ideas or bring new new tools and technology to make it better like we did so why did broward not work but westport did i, I don't know because i wasn't part of broward other than you know look this is a cyclical industry and it's mm -hmm. a tough industry and um and it, it's a tough industry because do you did Westport always bring out like new models every year or did you stick with kind of what you knew, the 110 or the 112? So that 112, uh, I believe they're on hole 60. It went from, you know, 2001 is when that model was introduced all the way to this year. Yeah, yeah. So 50 some hulls. Everything was tweaked inside, but the envelope didn't change. And neither did the layout. Like, no. Obviously we do underwater lights. So when yep. you go on a one, you know, the 112, you know where everything is. I know how to get to that. <laughs> well, it's the same thing if you, again, use Boeing. You know, we're back and forth from Seattle. So if you use Boeing, there's the 737. Yeah. Then there's one generation, 737, two, three. And so it evolved, 747, all of them did. And we literally took the aviation standards and models and applied them to our industry. Oh, that's awesome. And kept discipline in doing so. But that's great with, like, uh, contractors we work with. You know, they need to fix the HVAC system on yeah. 112. Yeah. I know exactly how You know where that. it's at. I know exactly how that's going to take yeah. and how much it's going to cost. You know where it's at. And so, but with that... We required a lot of discipline, a lot of capital, mm. uh, and a vision. And uh, again, we were fortunate, fortunate enough to have worked with someone that had uh, done that before in the past. So in 2014, you came over here, right? In 2014, uh, you I left the West Coast. I, le no, I left uh, Westport in 2013, and then the, uh, the association had been calling and said, "Hey, would you come down and, and hear some of the issues we're facing?" And I love the industry. I, like I said, I live north of here in Vero Beach, mm -hmm. uh, but I do love the industry. And I said, "Okay." Well, let's go check these boxes. And then as you check those boxes, you add a couple more. And uh, here I still am. 
Was that a hard transition from S Seattle over here? I mean, I spent most of my life here, so I was back and forth to Seattle. I was traveling around the world extensively as we built the brand, mm -hmm. um, so it was nice to wake up in the morning, put your feet on the side of the bed, and know where the bathroom was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after a lot of travel, that does start to become an issue, doesn't it? It does. So. Yeah, I'm not. I don't know if you look at me, but I'm not getting any younger. So what are you? 45? Yeah, oh, perfect. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But I also hear you're retiring next month well like right? anything you, you have to have a plan yeah and so um i've extended um we, we you know again we've got this great team together and so last thing i want to do is disrupt the team and so we've changed my schedule around and we've slowed the search and uh you know when we find that right person mm -hmm. um then we'll know we found that right person and so you're going to be interviewing the successor or are you going to leave that to the team or um i'll participate in it also i get you that's very very cool what's next for you then you know, I have no idea. Um, I, I love the industry. I've got a couple grandkids. Uh, I enjoy Very my cool. family, and yeah. uh, so I'll do so a lot of that. So it's more retirement than... I don't like the word retirement. Time. I don't sit around and do... I, I don't do anything well in, in terms of doing nothing. I can tell you. And, I can tell you. So, big cowboy boots. Yeah, big on. cowboy boots. So I don't play golf. Uh, you can tell I'm not a tennis player. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll always do something. Love it. Well, Phil, thank you very much for your time, Thank you. And we'll... Uh, well, I'll play something. Thank <laughs> you.